Thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Avi Angel, and I'm president of uh, Friends of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. I'm absolutely delighted to be here on this occasion, uh, minding my colleague and newfound friend, Professor Mark Walport, the 15th Henry G. Friesen International Prize winner. Uh, Vice President Dean, thank you for your great help in organizing this event, and uh, uh, President Vivek Gohl, a friend of long-standing who can't be here, I hope he gets a good report on uh, this event, but it's just wonderful here to participate in this uh, activity as you host our uh, Friesen Prize winner. Um, Friends of CIHR is a national organization uh, uh, representing individuals, uh, organizations with the express purposes of supporting the goals and ideals of CIHR, uh, of communicating science to the uh, wider public, and of uh, recruiting and retaining uh, young scientists in the pipeline of uh, health research. We advocate and educate uh, at all levels to support science generally. The organization began in 1997 uh, when uh, Dr. Henry Friesen asked me to uh, establish an organization called Alumni and Friends of MRC. Uh, and in those days, it was uh, a preview to the creation of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, which uh, was established uh, in the year 2000, coincident with Dr. Alan Bernstein taking over uh, as the uh, inaugural president of CIHR. And ever since then, we've been doing what we do, and the principal event and activity of uh, Friends of CIHR and its promotional activity um, was elaborated on and expanded with the creation of the Henry G. Friesen International Prize in Health Research. And this became a vehicle through which we uh, identify exceptional individuals internationally to come visit uh, and give lectures and this has grown significantly over the 15 uh, years of its existence. Well, the Friesen Prize is not only a prize in recognition of excellence internationally, the Friesen Prize also offered an opportunity to expand the program nationally. And in that context, what we developed was a program that's a week long where our uh, laureates come and visit universities across the country and engage in the traditional activity of teaching and mentoring at a most senior level. Because we invite the Friesen Prize winner to undertake commitments to meet leadership, uh, to meet senior administrators and senior scientists, as well as students uh, at the um, early level in graduate training. The whole idea is to share this international excellence with a wide public, nas uh, wide, uh, uh, public nationally which serves as a cohesive force to our Canadian research enterprise by tying this all together. And it's been very, very effective, and we're delighted that we can do it this year in person, which uh, is an important event we're marketing because for the last two years, everything's been virtual, and you lose the experience, the opportunity, and the imprinting effect of meeting people face-to-face, -face, which we value uh, so much. Now, the prize winner undertakes not only a Friesen lecture, which is recorded and uh, uh, subsequently shared online, but also uh, six years ago, we started to launch roundtables. Roundtables serve a, a very important purpose because what they do is alert the host institution to gather the experts in a general field to concentrate on an issue of the day that's important and worth discussing and elaborate on that in the context of the Friesen Prize, thereby expanding the imp impact of the lecture itself and leaving a legacy of knowledge, understanding, and ultimately we publish these as proceedings which we can share widely. And this is very, very uh, useful too and it's been very successful, so we're, we're happy about that. As well, uh, there's a social element to this uh, too. So. Uh, our Friesen Prizes are burdened with parties, which is fun, everybody else enjoys, because we bring together the opportunity of leadership and uh, student life uh, to the attention of our uh, guest of honor, and that has a lasting effect, which accumulates over the years. So with the institutions we've been visiting over the years, and this is the first time uh, at Waterloo, and we hope 
it, it, it continues, is that there are legacies established of, of this event. And with that, I'll give the podium back up to why you're here to, in the first place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Angel, for being with us today. And thank you so much for bringing this lecture to the University of Waterloo. Really appreciate all the help that you did in the planning and the execution. It is with great pleasure that I welcome and introduce Sir Mark Walport, physician scientist, academic leader, and visionary health research planner, the named recipient of the 2020 Henry G. Friesen International Prize in Health Research. Professor Mark Walport is Chief Executive of the UK Research and Innovation, which brings together the seven research councils, Innovate UK and Research England, and has a budget of a bit more than 12 billion Canadian dollars. He's a champion of fundamental science in health research, engineering, technology, and innovation. Sir Mark obtained his clinical and PhD degrees at Cambridge University. His scientific interests were in the molecular and genetic basis of inflammatory diseases of the joint, and he trained clinically as a rheumatologist. Prior to entering government, Sir Mark was Professor of Medicine and Chair of the Division of Medicine at Imperial College London, Hammersmith Hospital. Through his affiliation with the Wellcome Trust, Sir Mark Walport made major contributions, first as governor and then for 10 years as director. He supported some of the most important initiatives in the UK, in UK biomedicine in particular, and saw the completion of sequencing of the human genome at the Sanja Center and championed some of the world's first policies on open access science. During this time, the Wellcome Trust became the most influential independent funder of medical research in the UK and amongst the most influentially globally in biomedical research policy. Much of this was due to Sir Mark's visionary leadership and his perseverance. In 2013, he was appointed the UK government's chief scientific advisor and head of the government's office for science. In this role, he provided advice to government at the highest level on a range of crucial scientific topics across all scientific domains. This clearly illustrates Sir Mark's profile and deep understanding of the science agenda, not only in life sciences, but in also very important areas, climate change, digital infrastructure, agriculture. Throughout his career, Sir Mark has been a vocal supporter for the need to take a collaborative and multidisciplinary approach to tackling major problems facing society. In 2016, Sir Paul Nurse was asked by government to examine how the UK funding environment might be reshaped by examining the funding to each of the research councils in relation to their ability to work across disciplines. The idea emerged of an entity called UK Research and Innovation, and in 2018, Sir Mark became the first chief executive of this bold new concept. Throughout his career, Sir Mark has also been an ardent supporter of the arts and popular television personality. As spokesperson for science and for innovation, Sir Mark has been the recipient of many honors and prizes, including 10 honorary degrees and a knighthood in 2019. The Henry G. Friesen International Prize in Health Research established in 2005 by the Friends of Canadian Institutes for Health Research, recognizes exceptional innovation by a visionary leader, a health leader of international stature. The Friesen Prize is awarded annually. Sir Mark Walport has been delivering public talks 
this fall in conjunction with the Friesen Prize Program. Please join me in welcoming Sir Mark Walport for the Friesen Lecture, When Science Meets Society, the Competition Between Knowledge and Values. Sir Mark, we are delighted to have you here with us today. Well, thank you very much indeed, Professor Dean. Um, and it's an enormous privilege to visit the University of Waterloo and to be able to speak to real people, um, something that hasn't been possible for people around the world for the last almost two years now. And um, hello to everyone online as well uh, in our new world of hybrid existence. Uh, it used to be quite an adventure to cross the Atlantic um, to uh, come to uh, North America. It then became rather easier, uh, but it's adventure again at the moment, I can tell you. But it's a, a, an adventure worth undertaking because I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I think everyone will recognize that uh, science has become extraordinarily salient over the last few years. Um, and obviously the focus has been on the pandemic of coronavirus, but it's also salient in the context of so many other challenges that face human societies around the world. Um, and at a time when there are now more than seven and a half billion people living on the planet, um, the consequences of that in terms of uh, pollution both visible and invisible, so the invisible pollution being carbon emissions uh, with all the climate change, but also emissions of gases such as uh, nitrogen dioxide um, of uh, small PM2.5 particles. And of course the visible pollution um, and the degradation of the environment and the challenges to all the species with which we share the planet. And so science is hugely salient for all of these issues and uh, what I'm going to talk about over the next few minutes is how some of those scientific issues uh, rub up against people's values in society. And I think it's important at the beginning to say that when I talk about science, um, I think it's completely wrong that we have a sort of competition between STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and the arts and the humanities. Um, we need all of the disciplines of scholarship, really, and I, I prefer to talk about STEAM rather than STEM, so science, technology, engineering, the arts and humanities, and mathematics, because we really need everything, and this applies at least as much in the management of coronavirus, where a vaccine is no good if it's in a syringe. It's only any good if it's got into an arm, and we know that there are significant numbers of people around the planet who, uh, for reasons that uh, we may find hard to fathom, uh, are against the concept of vaccination. And so we need the social sciences to understand how people think about things like vaccines. Um, but I'll start with coronavirus because I think it is the most uh, salient and immediate case study, if you like. And uh, it has been an extraordinary couple of years. And uh, of course, it's virtually the centenary of the last huge global pandemic of influenza at the end of the First World War that killed more people than had been killed in the First World War itself. And that, of course, ran for a number of years, particularly 1918 and 1919. And um, certainly in the UK, um, it's been extraordinary that how uh, press conferences from Number 10 Downing Street, the home of the Prime Minister, he stood flanked by the government chief scientific advisor on one hand and the chief medical officer on the other. And uh, people have become familiar with PowerPoint presentations of the sort that we're used to in scientific seminars. Um, and people will talk about um, reproduction numbers of viruses. They'll talk about uh, all sorts of extraordinary RNA. They'll talk about PCR reactions, all the things that would not have been in the public domain at all, really. Uh, with also, uh, next slide please, you're on mute, and all the sort of neologisms that have come out of uh, coronavirus. And we should, I think, agree that science has made an absolutely extraordinary difference. Uh, in 1918, imagine if we'd had this pandemic uh, 100 years ago. Uh, and this is actually a much nastier virus than uh, influenza. Um, uh, and then, of course, uh, they thought that Haemophilus influenzae, a bacterium, was the cause of influenza. But within a matter of weeks after the 
uh, infection was first identified. It was known to be a coronavirus. The sequence was made available. And so it has been an extraordinary time for science. And that open access to the sequence of the virus led very rapidly to diagnostics. Um, we've had large clinical cohorts gathered together, the power of collaboration. And I should say that I'm delighted to be in Canada also because we have so many international links and collaborations. Um, but we've had large clinical cohorts with very rapid, accurate description of disease. It's been possible to forward it, uh, move this forward. We've seen Darwinian evolution of a virus occurring in real time in slightly scary ways. So we're now on the letter of the Greek alphabet to Micron. Um, unfortunately, there are quite a few Greek letters left, and um, we'll add numbers to them afterwards. So uh, we know this pandemic is definitely not over yet. Uh, vaccines have been developed in absolutely record time using novel technologies. And we've had clinical trials leading to new treatments showing that, for example, that dexamethasone works to reduce mortality. And uh, drugs which are the favorite of some people, such as hydroxychloroquine, don't work at all. Um, but the truth is, of course, in spite of all this, there's much we don't know still about coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about the science advice now. Much of the science advice throughout has actually been as much about the uncertainties um, and the models, which, of course, models offer projections under different scenarios. And the models that have been presented to policymakers have wide confidence limits on them. But when these get to the media, they tend to be portrayed as predictions, which, of course, models are not. Um, and it is the uncertainty that has been the hardest to communicate to policymakers um, and to the public. And the media in particular finds it very difficult to present uncertainty as just that. What it prefers to do is to present two or sometimes more people who have differing opinions. And these are all too easy to find because it's the nature of being a scientist or a researcher that uh, you're skeptical and there's lots of disagreement. But I think the challenge in broadcast media is that the very short time of interviews, coupled with a desire to present diverse views, means that nuance is extremely hard to convey. And of course, in the face of differing views, how do people decide who to believe? And I think we can probably also agree that um, in spite of some of the most outstanding science and indeed sophisticated mechanisms for scientific advice, a number of countries, and I would include the UK amongst them, um, have ended up with amongst the highest death rates in the world. Um, though I think it's also fair to say that there remains considerable uncertainty about what the true death rates are from COVID-19 in many countries around the world. The information is very incomplete. But having said that, there is really no doubt at all that some of the highest death rates in the world have occurred in some of the richest countries with highly sophisticated health systems and scientific infrastructure. And uh, you only have to go south of the border to see uh, a, a supreme example of that, a country with the most sophisticated scientific infrastructure in the world, um, but also accompanied by one of the most unequally distributed healthcare systems. So what are the reasons for the bad outcomes in um, some of the rich democratic countries? And I think the first is um, that the political nature of liberal democracies strongly conditions policymakers against restricting the liberty of people to mix freely. That's something that comes difficulty. It is the nature of democracies that they are free. And freedom comes with um, the expectation that people can do things. And so uh, policymakers, and it's not, I won't generalize to all countries because countries are each different. Um, and the one thing I learned as government chief scientific advisor is that uh, you don't, wherever possible, criticize other countries although actually I implicitly already have slightly, but never mind. Um, um, and, of course, on the other side of the coin, in return, uh, the coronavirus isn't very interested in politics um, or um, policies per se. There's nothing that the coronavirus likes more than the opportunity to jump freely from one human to another. Um, and so I think it's fair to say that in a number of countries, including the UK, a reluctance by policymakers to restrict people's liberty led to some late decisions um, and therefore 
inevitably the, 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 the greater national growth and spread of the infection. But I think that the biggest lesson from the coronavirus pandemic, to me at any rate, is that we haven't invested sufficiently in public health systems. And I think there are some important reasons for this. So firstly, uh, clean water, safe food, good medical care, effective antibiotics have shifted the focus of public health in richer countries away from the prevention and management of infectious disease towards the prevention and management of chronic conditions such as obesity with associated diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And I think it's also true that countries are much better prepared to deal with the last emergency than they are with the next one. And so countries that have experienced significant epidemics of serious infectious diseases in the last decade or two, in general, have been much better prepared for the COVID pandemic. But I think that the, I would say that the important lesson has been that we haven't paid the insurance policy to maintain really good infection control because in many countries it hasn't been a salient day-to-day -day issue. And the consequences of that lack of insurance have been hugely expensive. But this is not a talk solely about COVID-19. It is actually a talk about the interactions between science and society, and particularly between science and policymakers. And um, I had the privilege after um, leading the Wellcome Trust for 10 years to become, move into government. And I'll say a little bit more about the history of science advice in the UK government in a minute. Um, and uh, one of the things I learned about is the issues that come, the role of the science advisor as opposed to the role of the policymaker. Um, and people used to quite frequently ask me in talks, you know, how do you manage when politicians don't take your advice? Um, but the answer is, of course, that the policymakers in democratic societies are the people that we elect as politicians. They're the ones that make the decisions. Um, and the role of the science advisor is to provide advice. And Winston Churchill famously said, although he didn't actually originate this quote, that scientists should be on tap, but not on top. Um, so the real policymakers are the people we elect, the government, and then specifically ministers who individually and collectively are responsible for governing the country, who are held to account by parliament and the judiciary, um, and we hold to account when we elect them at periodic intervals. So uh, wind back a, a few years, because in 2012, I'd actually been the director of the Wellcome Trust for almost 10 years. And because the Wellcome Trust is a large, significant funder of biomedical research, um, in the UK, uh, what the Wellcome Trust did was fairly relevant to policymakers, and so I'd become involved with uh, government. I'd uh, joined the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology in 2004, and had become increasingly involved in matters of science policy, including in contentious issues such as research involving animals, uh, use of technologies around in vitro fertilization, use of medical data, which is an enormously important issue that we were talking about in the round table immediately before this talk, actually. Um, and so the opportunity arose then to become the government's chief scientific advisor. And the role of the chief scientific advisor in the UK has a history that dates back to the Second World War, uh, when, not surprisingly, science advice was absolutely crucial to the outcome of the war. And uh, the sort of sad truth is that there is a long history of warfare as a stimulus for investment in science and its applications. Um, and indeed, there is nothing quite like an emergency to stimulate innovation and to liberate people from the bureaucracy that has the potential to stifle creativity and risk-taking and to slow down progress. And, um, of course, the modern history of science funding really follows uh, warfare. The, most of the modern structures for the public funding of um, research followed firstly the First World War, um, when some of the most uh, distinguished uh, scientists of the time uh, were involved in solving the problems of warfare. So um, uh, 
Sir Lawrence Bragg, um, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in his early 20s and learned of it in the trenches in France um, in the First World War, um, used a sound location to locate uh, artillery pieces. Um, and um, he survived the war. Another equally distinguished uh, physicist at the time, Henry Moseley, was killed in the trenches at about the same time, uh, who would almost certainly have won the Nobel Prize as well. Um, and uh, Vannevar Bush, who was the um, US president's chief scientific advisor in the uh, Second World War, who wrote some extraordinarily prophetic words about uh, the future of information technology and computing very relevant in this university, which has such a distinguished history in uh, computer science um, and uh, uh, machine learning, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, it was a report that he wrote to President Roosevelt at the end of the Second World War that ultimately led to the formation of the National Science Foundation. So um, after the war in the UK, the most senior advise, scientific advisor in government was perhaps not surprisingly located in the Ministry of Defense until 1964. And the incumbent at the time was a very distinguished anatomist, uh, Sir Solly Zuckerman, who later became Lord Zuckerman, who converted his role from being the chief scientific advisor to the, the Ministry of Defense to become the first chief scientific advisor to the government. And so it was in 2013 that I found myself as the 11th government chief scientific advisor and uh, a Whitehall Permanent Secretary reporting to the Cabinet Secretary and the Prime Minister and Head of the Government Office for Science. Um, and I, I must confess that I didn't think at medical school that that was a possible, or I never even heard of it as a possible long-term career outcome. But in parenthesis, uh, the best advice that I ever had uh, in my career was from my PhD supervisor when I finished in his laboratory and I had a choice of jobs. Um, and he said to me, well, you know, careers can't be planned. Um, and I took that advice more seriously than I think either of us expected. Um, so the job description for the government chief scientific advisor in the UK is quite precise, whilst being rather vague and open in its interpretation. Put simply, it's to provide advice to the government on all aspects of science, engineering, technology, and the social sciences for all of government policy. Um, and so like most jobs near the centre of government, and that applies anywhere in the world, it's a job that's heavily influenced by events, um, especially emergencies where science can help. And so biological, geophysical, and human-created emergencies have defined the tenure of a number of the government chief scientific advisors. I think it's fair to say no more so than my successor, uh, Patrick Valence, who's had the hardest job of all of the UK GCSAs, which is to deal with this first really severe global pandemic since the flu pandemic of 1918 and 1919, working very closely with the chief medical officer, who was one of the departmental uh, chief scientific advisors, uh, Professor Chris Whitty. Um, and they have had uh, uh, done an extraordinary job. Um, and whilst I did have very brief pangs when this all started, it would have been pretty interesting to be the chief scientific advisor, I realized pretty rapidly that it was very, I was very lucky personally, because I mean, it has been the most extraordinary intense period for them and for similar people working in governments around the world. Uh, the pressure has been relentless, the workload has been continuous. And um, for reasons that we'll explore a little bit further, uh, they have become very public figures, but as such are uh, figures of hate to some people. Um, and uh, there have been assaults on on at least one of them, so um, it's not been easy. But looking back at previous uh, government chief scientific advisors, uh, Sir Bob May um, had to deal with bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Um, and that was extraordinarily difficult because no one quite knew what was going on there. Um, and some very tough decisions had to be made in the face of uncertainty. And I think that's one of the most important features of science advice, that actually a lot of it is about communicating uncertainty. And, of course, it's very difficult for policymakers because uh, if you're a, a, a medic, it, it's quite a good training. You do have to make decisions in the face of uncertainty. There's no use uh, if you've got a patient sitting across the table from you to say, well, you know, this is all very interesting. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply for a research grant and in five years' time I'll come back and tell you what I think we ought to do. Uh, this doesn't go down well 
And so there are circumstances in which you have to make decisions based on fairly high levels of uncertainty. And I think that's one of the things that the scientific community don't always uh, appreciate and understand effectively. And the a response to a minister um, who needs some knowledge for a policy decision, which is to say, well, that's very interesting, minister, but the real question is this. Well, actually, the real question isn't that. It's the question the minister asked. And um, if the minister's told, uh, yes, give me a $3 million or whatever, and five years, uh, the researcher is likely to be sent away with a flea in their ear, which isn't to say that the research isn't important to do, uh, but that's, uh, the, as it were, the mechanism for funding that is slightly different. Um, and then Sir David King had to deal with foot and mouth disease, and my immediate predecessor, uh, Sir John Beddington, had two geophysical events to deal with. He had to deal with the volcanic eruption of Ayafjalla Jokul, the Icelandic volcano that spewed ash into the um, relatively high atmosphere, disrupting uh, transatlantic flights for a significant period of time, um, which was uh, pretty stressful for um, everyone at the time. Um, and then he had to deal with the tsunami at Fukushima. Um, and uh, he provided very, very clear advice to UK citizens living in Japan, in fact, telling them that the exposure to radiation they were likely to get in places like Tokyo was actually rather less than they would get on the flight back from Tokyo to London. Um, and that was very sound advice at a time when some countries were telling their nationals to evacuate. Um, but his calm advice helped calm down uh, the people in Japan itself. It was a wonderful example of scientific diplomacy in action. Um, and um, so it, it, it was very important, actually. Um, and in my time as, as government chief scientific advisor, I um, had a relatively straightforward time in a way. I had advice to provide advice on recurrent national floods um, and on Ebola and Zika, both you know, potentially very serious, but posing relatively low threat to um, countries outside the uh, tropical regions, and then an earthquake in Nepal. But a great deal has changed in government scientific advice in the UK since the time of Solly Zuckerman. Uh, it's become quite extensively embedded right across government. Almost every government department now has its own chief scientific advisor, uh, bringing their specific domain expertise to the needs of the department. And part of my job was to lead this network of science advisors across government, and we would meet every Wednesday morning uh, in, uh, in my office. And then every Wednesday morning, I would go from there to the cabinet office for a Wednesday morning meeting which brought together all the permanent secretaries across government chaired by the cabinet secretary. But within weeks of taking up that role in 2013, I encountered several issues that forced me to think extremely carefully about science, how scientific knowledge is applied, about issues of risk and uncertainty, and about the challenges which arise where science meets human values. Uh, so the first of those, uh, which uh, comes around regularly, and indeed should come around even more regularly, I think, uh, was climate change because the International Panel of, on Climate Change, the IPCC, produced its fifth series of assessment reports in 2013 and 2014. And uh, appropriately, these attracted a great deal of political and public interest. And I found myself dispatched to the cabinet and to the TV and radio stations to explain what these reports were, uh, what they stated, and what were the implications. And by 2013, the scientific position on climate change was unequivocally clear, really. Um, the evidence that the Earth, the climate, is warming and that this is being caused largely by humans burning fossil fuels was extremely robust. So why was the presentation of the evidence still contested and contentious? And it, the reason is, and it was then and it remains very straightforward, actually, it is that to stop global warming requires a massive change in human behavior, which, of course, is to stop burning the fossil fuel that has actually powered the development of the modern world in which we live. Um, and one way to duck the policy challenge is simply to reject the science, and in doing so, to reject the need to do anything about the burning of fossil fuel. Now, in my view, this is an extremely dishonest approach to the issue. 
the proper approach should be to acknowledge the results of the scientific research, which are now absolutely beyond doubt in terms of the human role in global warming. What is the subject of legitimate debate is what policies we should implement to prevent, to mitigate, and to adapt to climate change. And I'll come back to this topic in a few minutes. And it reminds me again of my PhD supervisor who divided issues into two sorts. The, he, there were what he called polable issues, in other words, issues that you could vote upon, and non-polable issues, which are issues that you can't vote upon because actually there is a correct answer. And so a non-polable issue is whether humans are causing anthropogenic climate change. That's not actually an issue on which you can vote. There is a correct answer, and the function of uh, science is to reduce the uncertainty by observation and experimentation. And that's the method of science. And so that's how we learn about the natural universe. But it's not something you can vote on. Um, you can't vote on whether, um, on what the speed of light is. Uh, you can't vote on um, whether the, the Earth is roughly spherical. Um, there are answers to these questions. On the other hand, you can perfectly well vote on whether we decide to do anything or not about climate change, which is, you know, then depends on how you think about future generations. Um, so, but I will, I, I, I'll, I'll stay with this topic in different ways. So, a second issue that confronted me, and I, I got a lot of uh, heat from uh, various communities, required fairly urgent policy decisions in the face of very incomplete evidence. And this was the, uh, an issue that belonged to the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and was the decision as to whether the government should ban the use of neonicotinoid pesticides. Um, and there were very powerful and quite emotional forces, both for and equally against the banning of the substances. Um, uh, including farmers on one side and environmentalists on the other, but of course the two aren't mutually exclusive. There are some farming environmentalists as well. Um, and uh, the scientific community actually were quite divided and took very strong and opposing positions. So obviously the trade-off is that farmers were faced with the potential for insects to devastate their crops, um, but the use of these insecticides to prevent crop loss had to be considered against their potential to harm populations of pollinating insects, including amongst many species, bees, which have an iconic importance as the providers from ancient times of the nectar of honey. Um, and of course, as part of the equation, if neonicotinoids were banned, then there was a risk of substitution by other insecticides, each bringing their own harm to insect populations. So, uh, this wasn't an area of my primary expertise, and the job of the government chief scientific advisor is not to know everything, because no scientist will know an enormous amount outside their field. The, the, the job is to actually act as a transmission mechanism from the experts in the community uh, in a form that is uh, clear and comprehensible to policymakers who are not themselves scientists. So the answer to how to proceed was both simple in principle and quite hard in practice. Uh, the job for the government chief scientific advisor was to assess rigorously and dispassionately what evidence existed and what were the uncertainties. And to do this, I commissioned a small group of scientists with first class credentials for their expertise, independent mindedness and scientific rigor to identify all the available evidence and to produce an assessment report on all the effects of neonicotinoid usage and possible substitution. And on the basis of these reports, the policymakers decided at that time, which was now um, uh, nearly eight years ago, uh, that the use of neonicotinoids was supported by existing evidence, though with caution. Um, but in the light of the uncertainty, it was also agreed that it was necessary to commission further research on neonicotinoids. And of course, the research question isn't whether they can harm and kill a wide variety of insect species under laboratory conditions, because they absolutely can. Um, th the question is whether, when applied in concentrations as directed on real farms, uh, they harm species other than the intended target species. 
And over the last few years, the evidence from these and from other studies that neonicotinoids applied in field conditions do cause harm to a wide range of insect species has grown. So neonicotinoid use in the UK is now prohibited, except under exceptional circumstances requiring licensing. And if you're a policymaker, none of these are easy issues to deal with. On the one hand, we need safe, affordable, and secure sources of food. And on the other hand, we are custodians of other species and the natural resources of the planet for present and many future generations. And so exposure to such highly contested issues, and another one was the issue of bovine tuberculosis and the role of badgers uh, as uh, uh, intermediate transmitting species. Um, but within weeks of starting as a government chief scientist, drove it home to me how strongly scientific evidence and advice could become contested and contentious in areas where scientific evidence meets human values. And it also led me to think more about issues of trust, as it's important that scientific advisors behave in a trustworthy fashion. And so the key issue in trust is uh, to be trustworthy. That's the condition that's required to generate trust. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of talk over the last few years on the topic of trust and who trusts whom. And there are these public surveys, and we were talking about one earlier in the week, that typically show a high degree of trust in professional groups, such as doctors and scientists. And uh, in general, politicians and journalists vie for the least trusted groups of people. But all of these surveys miss the key point which is that trust is actually almost completely context-specific. So whilst we may not trust a journalist who's writing about political matters or indeed political parties seeking election, we will trust a journalist 100% who's reporting the hockey scores. Um, and a good constituency MP, like a good GP, will have a high degree of trust by many of their constituents. So one's always got to look at this question of trust in terms of the context. And so the converse of this, or the, 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 the corollary of this, is that a scientist who's talking on the radio about the Higgs boson will be um, implicitly trusted. Um, and uh, when scientists did go on the radio to talk about the Higgs boson when it was discovered, most of the criticism they got was from other physicists who said you haven't described it properly. Um, uh, and of course it's difficult to describe properly. Um, and um, if they're talking about the ones of the natural world, they'll be well trusted. But the second a scientist is talking about something that maybe means that people have to change what they do, when, when scientists seem to be telling people to change their lives, then they're less trusted. Um, but I think it's fair to say, and there's evidence to support it, that the scientists around the world who are providing clear explanations of what's going on in the COVID-19 pandemic have actually been well trusted. And so it has been, in terms of trust in science, it's been remarkably positive. But, uh, as I've said, scientists are much less trusted when they tell people how to live their lives, or indeed when the science touches on issues where people have strong religious or moral beliefs and values, for example, on assisting dying, on embryo research, on animal research, on genetically modified organisms. And some people believe that it is wrong to interfere with the sanctity of life or to fiddle with nature. Um, and those are views that one has to respect. I mean, these are deeply held personal views. Um, uh, people have powerful views about our relationship with each other and with the natural environment. Um, so we should recognize that trust is highly uh, context-specific. But I mean, that is where the power of democracy comes in because there will always be people who think that it is intolerable to do embryo, um, uh, interfere with embryos in some ways or to work with genetically modified organisms. Uh, but in a we live in plural societies and the function of democracies in a plural society is to resolve these issues on behalf. And so you never get a situation where everyone is happy and that's where uh, we should be proud that we live in parliamentary democracies that can resolve these issues. Um, but as I've already said, to be trusted, it's essential to behave in trustworthy ways. And uh, this is one of the reasons that politicians sometimes do badly, or quite frequently do badly in surveys of trust, because sadly there are all too many of examples of politicians behaving in untrustworthy fashions. Um, 
And um, of course, it's also relative because uh, the evidence that uh, a president south of the border frequently appeared to behave in untrustworthy ways hasn't prevented him from having had and indeed still retaining a very high level of support amongst large numbers of people. And that may be because uh, in, in terms of relative untrustworthiness, uh, one politician may be deemed to be untrustworthy, but um, uh, others much more untrustworthy. So it's all relative. But it's the essence of the scientific method that it depends on probing research, rigorous methodology, on skepticism, challenge, and on rigorous peer review, which, of course, is no more or no less than scrutiny by expert colleagues. And progress in scientific knowledge also depends typically on many small steps that collectively build knowledge. It's very rarely a single thing that changes the way we think about the world. And good scientists should be honest about not only what is known, but also what is not and what is uncertain. But the truth is that scientists, like doctors and politicians, have one thing in common. We're all human, and all humans are flawed to some degrees, and there are rotten apples amongst scientists, as there are amongst politicians. So skepticism is an important quality, and none of us should be too uh, put ourselves on pedestals because uh, we can't, you know, there isn't perfection in any community. But the need for skepticism does have to be weighed against the solidity of the evidence. So as I've said already, it's not sensible or valid to be skeptical about whether the Earth is roughly spherical or whether it's flat, or indeed whether COVID-19 is caused by a coronavirus, or indeed whether humans are causing climate change. Uh, in each of these cases, the weight and the extent of the evidence is so strong that there are no reasonable grounds to be skeptical about these and many other examples. And um, it, the US politician Daniel Moynihan neatly encapsulated this issue by saying, you can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. Um, but I will now return to climate change because um, it is perfectly reasonable to have, for people to have a say in what policies we support to respond to anthropogenic climate change. And here there are essentially three options. Uh, the first is to say we don't want to do anything uh, on the grounds that actually we don't really care about future generations. Uh, it's not a position that I imagine many people in this audience, um, either in person or online, would support. Uh, the second option is to do absolutely everything possible at whatever price and consequences for the lives of present planetary inhabitants. And then the third position is somewhere between the first and the second options, which, of course, is what politicians around the world are doing. Um, and that's where, of course, there's a huge amount of nuance about whether the balance is fair between the consequences for present and future humans on the planet. But the truth is as we've heard with the uh, COP26 conference that's just gone by, the danger of the delays in making and implementing policies and the compromises that are being made, unfortunately, is exposing future generations and indeed current generations, particularly of younger people, to extreme jeopardy. But we have to be clear, the policy decisions are made by the politicians that we have individually and collectively elected. And there are important differences of views and values between the young and the old. Um, it is the young that ultimately will reap the worst consequences of unmitigated climate change in comparison with the old. But I think the demography of many Western liberal democracies favors the old, who are a larger fraction of the population and are more inclined to exercise their vote. So, I think it's extremely important to encourage greater democratic participation by the young, and at the very most minimal level of participation, casting a vote comes with minimal effort and opportunity cost, and is enormously important. And there is evidence that we are not very good at thinking about future generations, so research that has been done shows that if you apply the sort of discount rate approach of economists, um, people have um, a 0% discount rate for their children and for their grandchildren because we can see them, hold them, relate to them. But when you ask people about their discount rate for their grandchildren's grandchildren, it goes up to 
we are very, very bad at thinking about future generations, even you know, four or five generations beyond us. But of course, the rate of change of climate is uh, four generations is or five generations is a you know an instant in geological time. So this is a very challenging issue. Um, there are other areas in which science, engineering, and technology come into conflict with human values. Um, and people talk a lot about equity and inequity. Um, the truth is that people will actually accept quite a high degree of inequality. If someone wins the lottery, people tend to say, well, jolly good for you. There may be an element of schadenfreude or if all that money makes people unhappy, but people don't think it's unfair that someone wins a lottery. Um, they don't particularly think it's unfair that... Uh, basketball players get um, paid enormous amounts of money, or football players in the UK. Um, but what they do like, dislike, is unfairness. And so if the benefits of research discoveries are realized for some and not for all, then this does cause significant problems, which can manifest as a mistrust for science, engineering, and technology. And an important and very timely example, I think, is how vaccines are distributed and made available. Um, these are by far and away the most important tool in our defense against coronavirus infection. Um, and indeed, one of the most striking effects of the coronavirus pandemic is that the most serious consequences of the, of the infection have been borne by the most economically and socially deprived people within communities, towns, and cities, and across different countries across the world. Um, and if you want a disease that identifies all of the social determinants of disease that were identified by people like Sir Michael Marmot at University College Hospital. This disease does it. Um, and um, I think that it, certainly in the UK, the distribution of vaccines in the UK has been one of the greatest successes contributed by science and the way it was operationalized by the National Health Service. But it still hasn't stopped the worst burden of the disease being felt by the least advantaged in society. And so across the world, billions of people have not yet received the benefits of vaccination. And there's some really interesting questions that I think uh, are, are being asked now and deserve to be looked at later about how the different vaccines have been made available and what the cost has been. And so the AstraZeneca vaccine, developed by scientists in Oxford, following their work on developing a vaccine for MERS, uh, another very nasty coronavirus um, that is still out there. And if that caused a pandemic, we would really be in trouble because that has a 30 or 40% mortality. Um, but anyway, the AZ vaccine was made available at cost. Um, whereas that's not been the case for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, whose cost is far beyond the reach of the poorer countries of the world. And the COVAX um, initiative uh, hasn't reached uh, the intended recipients. Uh, but this is just one example of many think about unfairness. The benefits of new science, engineering, and technology that we take for granted, that information technologists, computer scientists at the University of Waterloo are you know, developing extraordinary new applications. But they're not distributed equally across the world, leaving many of the poorest countries and people deprived of those benefits. Um, there's a second important example of where unfairness, which is either perceived or real, plays an important part in people's perception of science, and particularly its application, which I, you can sort of label as my pain, your gain. And a, a very typical example of that is infrastructure. So even the most ardent advocates for green energy may change their colors if there's a proposal to build a wind turbine in their backyard. Um, nuclear energy ticks almost every box when it comes to the conflict between science, engineering, and society. For some people, there is something unnatural and, radi uh, and frightening about uh, radioactivity and radiation. It's seen as an invisible and dangerous miasma, an evil in of itself. Um, and then there's the, the specific fear of nuclear power stations, um, which at one level are a huge piece of physical infrastructure that takes ages to build and dominates the locality, and at another end evoke images of Chernobyl and Fukushima. Although the truth is that uh, accidents from nuclear power have killed a tiny fraction of people compared to the people that have been killed by uh, fossil fuels, a minute fraction. Um, 
And so the evidence overall is that nuclear energy is substantially safer and I would argue greener than fossil fuels. Um, the mining of coal and its burning have killed millions of people across the planet um, and are a major threat to the health, well-being, resilience and security across the planet. Um, but in spite of the fact that a minute number of people have been harmed by civilian nuclear power, the fact remains that nuclear energy is one of the least trusted technologies that could nevertheless have a very important part to play in decarbonizing our power supplies. And this is where the, the, sort of the, 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 the technology and science really does meet values. Um, and, and then I think the final major area where science meets society with strongly contested outcomes is in the context of uncertainty. And here again, there are three possible responses faced with an application of science that offers uh, possible benefits, but accompanied by, or in, even probable benefits, but accompanied by uncertainty about possible risks. Um, so with new technologies, the first is to simply throw caution to the winds and get on with the beneficial application. Uh, the second is the opposite one, which is to apply the so-called precautionary principle and to refrain from the application altogether, thereby missing out on all of the potential benefits. And of course, the third um, is to take a middle ground, which is to apply the science, the engineering, and the technology, but in a regulated and appropriately cautious fashion. And of course, this third pathway is the absolutely established approach in medicine to the introduction of new drugs and other therapies and diagnostics. Um, and uh, systems regulation and medical science, there are rigorous cl graded clinical trials to establish and measure objectively benefits and side effects of new interventions. And then even after it's deemed safe to introduce new treatments in medicine, these can typically only be prescribed by licensed practitioners, and there should be long-term reporting of adverse effects. But these very detailed processes in medicine are the exception rather than the rule for the introduction of new technologies. They're also enormously expensive in and of themselves and are one of the factors that limit the widespread availability of new treatments across the world at affordable prices. So there are trade-offs even for, uh, in the context of regulation. And of course the current technological revolution, um, highly relevant to this university that is transforming the lives of people across the world, is the digital revolution. And of course at the bleeding edge of the digital revolution are things like digital cryptocurrencies but also the applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, and in the case of the digital cryptocurrencies, that's essentially bypassed national banks and regulation. It provides a global currency that's largely unregulated and is undoubtedly a major vehicle for illegal trading of all sorts of goods and rather unpleasant services. Um, though it's quite interesting that the Chinese have recently banned trading using cryptocurrencies, which may or may not be an, a harbinger of the future. And artificial intelligence is certainly here to stay, has enormous potential. And we could debate for many hours, and I dare say in this university it is debated for hours and hours, the potential benefits and potential harms of artificial intelligence. And all of these are examples of the inevitability that any new technology carries the possibility of beneficial and harmful events. So the discovery of, by our ancient ancestors of how to generate and harvest the benefits of fire is, an ancient, is an, a, an ancient example. And I wonder then whether there were debates about whether the use of fire should be banned because it could burn people. Um, I rather doubt if the benefits of warmth and cooked warm food were contested by those worrying about the ill effects of fire. So the question I think for any new technology is not, is it a good thing or not? Rather it is, is the use of the technology for this specific purpose in this particular fashion acceptable? So uh, to give you a specific example, it's uh, not, I think, a good question to ask whether genetically modified organisms are a good thing or a bad thing. It's always what gene, what organism, and for what purpose. But I think what I want to leave you with is that I think that uh, we do need to think about the interactions of science and all the sciences with uh, policies. Um, and I think that I ended my time as a government chief scientific advisor realizing it's much easier to be a scientific advisor than it is to be a policymaker. That's a really tough job. And uh, people quite often used to ask me, well, you know, why are there so few uh, scientists in government as though it was my fault? Um, but you can't blame the people 
that are in parliaments because they've stood for election. You can only blame the people that haven't. And it is not part of the culture of science, engineering, and technology, particularly in Western democracies, to enter politics. There is the occasional exception. And I would just end with a, being in a university with a challenge, which is that if your child goes to university to read history, no one says to them, ah, you're going to be a historian. History is taught as a, an education for life. Um, if your child, as in fact our eldest daughter was, was going to university to read chemistry, everyone said to her, ah, you're going to be a chemist, which indeed she has become. Um, and so we teach science as though it was a vocational education, whereas actually science is you couldn't have, and I include engineering and technology, you couldn't have a better education for life. A scientist, in order to be successful, has to be uh, rigorous, skeptical, inquiring, numerate. They have to be able to communicate effectively, because science isn't finished until it's been communicated effectively. These are the skills that you need for success in almost all walks of life. And yet we teach scientists, we educate them as though it's a vocation. And so why are we surprised when scientists, engineers, and technologists don't go into things like politics, don't go into public policy, don't go into becoming civil servants, don't even become teachers. We only have ourselves to blame. And so I think I just leave you with a sort of challenge that I think that uh, the question about why don't the policymakers listen to you is not the right question, really. It's actually how do we get policymakers who will appreciate the breadth, the strength, and the importance of science, and how scientists will actually distinguish between the questions that are non-polable and the questions on which we are all entitled to vote, where scientists don't necessarily have any particular uh, superior expertise. Thank you for your attention. What amazing breath in the talk. Um, so many thoughtful remarks for all of us here. We'll, we'll take one or two questions from the audience before we close the session. I invite members here or members online to post questions. Um, and I'll ask a question while we wait for the audience to consider what may be a, an interesting place to ask. So Mark, you talked about science communications mm. and trust in scientists. There is a world of misinformation out mm. there. And you know, I'll also say that scientists criticize each other as part and parcel of the academic discipline. But when, when things become very public, oh, corona, virus, uh, sustainability, climate change, and there, are, there is the, the natural tendency to consider and evaluate, and that spills over into the public discourse, it becomes very confusing for politicians, yep for the general audience. I wonder if you could comment a bit on the misinformation aspect and also about science communications broadly. I think it's one of the reasons it's important for governments to have effectively embedded mechanisms of science advice. And part of the embedded mechanism is that it actually is broadly consultative. So, um, uh, and in the UK, the government chief scientific advisor working with the chief medical officer chairs a committee which is called SAGE. In general, I don't like acronyms, but this one's not a bad acronym, which is a scientific advice group in emergencies. And that is configured using variable geometry, depending on what the emergency is. And so, uh, but, but I think that it, it's been quite noticeable that some scientists have become quite emotional and, and have, have, as it were, stepped beyond the science and the evidence to some extent. And uh, uh, that's one of the challenges for the media. And it is, I think, you know, on the one hand, it is the job of the media to present uh, balance as far as possible. But balance isn't achieved by presenting an equal and opposite view. Uh, a mechanism that's proved very effective in the UK is the creation of an organization called the Science Media Center. Uh, which has been going for quite a few years now. I don't know whether there's an equivalent one in Canada. In Canada. They're, they're, they, it has seeded 
um, uh, not quite franchises, but similar models across the world. And that's been very effective because it brings together, particularly science journalists, with a panel of uh, expert scientists to cover all sorts of issues. And so in the UK, the Science Media Center has been extremely active throughout the whole of the pandemic. And so journalists have had immediately access to very good, clear science communicators um, on a regular basis. And in general, I would distinguish between science reporting by science journalists, where they, I would say again, uh, speaking for the UK, they've done an excellent job throughout the pandemic. When science gets into hands of political journalists, it's a bit like when science gets in the hands of politicians. The political journalists behave like politicians, not surprisingly. And so that's more difficult. Then the, the, the other part of your question, which is, I think, a different problem altogether, is um, the extraordinary conspiracy theories and very odd beliefs, sort of, consp uh, well, odd beliefs certainly to, I think, probably most people in the audience, the sort of things that links vaccines to microchips, to 5D, 5G aerials, where uh, to QAnon, to um, climate denial. And that's a, a rather dangerous and powerful associate of populism that's coming around the planet. And that's not simply countered by the voice of reason. And I think that we need, is why we need the social sciences, uh, the arts and the humanities as well, because this is a, a I think most of us would perceive this is, a, is actually a threat to democracy. Um, and it's a threat to the, if you like, the values of the enlightenment in terms of appreciating the importance of evidence and, uh, and uh, knowledge. Um, and I don't have a, a simple solution to this. It's very, very dangerous, I think. I think it does threaten democracies around the world. Um, and I think that the important thing is that democracies have got to defend themselves. But that's easy to say, and quite. I'm glad it's not my job to have to do it, as it were. So uh, it, it, it's almost, in, in a way, a completely different talk. But I mean, throughout my recent career, I've been very interested in open access to science. Um, and preprint servers have worked well, I think, in physics, in chemistry, and maths, where they've served, where the communities are relatively small, and where, in general, the papers don't actually touch on how people live their lives. Um, and they've served as a very powerful way of actually a sort of open form of peer review, improving the publication to a point at which it goes from a preprint to a, uh, a permanent part of the scientific record. Um, in the case of biomedical science, I think on the plus side, when research has been done, it should be published. Um, but the whole point about the preprint server is it is just that. It is pre-peer review. It is an opportunity to get things out into the public domain. But I deplore the fact, actually, that um, certain researchers have actually actively promoted preprints where uh, they, were, they will probably never get through any form of rigorous peer review. And I think that the danger of preprints in biomedicine is that they can cause harm. And so, for example, a bad clinical trial published as a preprint could cause people to misapply a medical therapy either by denying it or giving things that... Now, to some extent, that's protected because uh, medicines, by and large, are regulated. And so, and you know, when is, when is a treatment ever introduced on one trial? It's very rare that one is so good. So I think that... Should we turn the clock back and say we shouldn't have preprint servers? I don't think so. I think it is a step in the right direction. But I think there is an aspect of um, scientific responsibility that people should recognize that a preprint is just that. It's not something that should be promoted. And um, But can you then... Uh, a, a preprint server is open to everyone. And so a smart journalist is going to be able to trawl through the preprints very easily and potentially write misleading articles. But then I think the scientific community has probably got to stand up and write and say, you, you know, this is, this is not peer-reviewed. So I think it's a really interesting question. And I think it, it's, I, 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 it wasn't a surprise to me that this problem had cropped up. Uh, I mean, it always struck me that it was a potential risk for biomedical science where uh, a lot is at stake if you publish something wrong. <laughs>
Um, but, um, I mean, do you have a solution for it? No. Uh, no, it, it's interesting. I, I think, you know, is openness a good thing? I think it is. But, but it has brought new um, risks. So, Mark, we are very grateful, really appreciative that you came here to talk to us today. And I know that it's not been an easy trip for you. Mm -hmm. And um, in particular, Sir Mark told us about the difficulties at the Toronto airport. <laughs> and uh, you know the lineups and what he faced there. So thank you so much for coming. And Dr. Angel, thank you so much for bringing the Friesen Lecture to the University of Waterloo.